Good afternoon. I would like to call this meeting of the Oldham County Board of Education to order. It's October 25th, 2021, and we are at the Arvin Education Center. Uh, first I'm an item of business is to Corrections or admissions, Superintendent? Yes, I'd like to make uh, two, uh, two, two amendments to the agenda. Um, superintendent report item number four should uh, reference 22-23 school year for enrollment projections and we also have uh, an amendment for um, item uh, for action item really superintendent report um, number six and for the board enclosure and that's also tied to uh, item K for action items and each of the board members have a uh, revised copy of that enclosure. Excellent. Thank you, sir. So motion to approve the agenda, please. Made by Mr. Dodson, seconded by Mr. Kehoe. All those in favor, and that's 5-0. I am going to ask the uh, Director of the Public Health Department, Mr. Matt Rhodes, to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. The flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Rhodes. I know you were getting ready to just jump up here. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Let's go um, immediately. We have a uh, one item of board business to conduct, and that is an election for the vice chairman's seat. So I'm going to open uh, it up to board members to see if there is a nomination for that role. Mr. Kehoe. I would like to nominate Larry Dodson for vice chair. So there's a nomination for Mr. Dodson to serve as vice chair. Is there a second? A second. Ms. Uh, Nucker seconded that. All those in favor? And that would be four. Is there an opposition? Four to one. Thank you, everybody. Congratulations, Mr. Dodson. <laughs> Superintendent, let's go straight to our instructional session, sir. Sure. At this time, I'd like to call Ms. Uh, McKinley to, uh, to come forward and, and give the board an update uh, with, regarding our data for our school district. Excellent. Welcome, Ms. McKinley. Why are you giggling? Is that the name wrong? I did. McKinley. Yeah, you can. Because we usually call you Leslie. Ms. McKinley, no. Apologies. <laughs> I, I do. I do know. We we all. We all. Yeah. Yeah. Data guru. You did something, right? Yeah. Hello. Welcome. Well, no. Will you please can I take this off? Yes. <clears throat> we appreciate the opportunity to share with you um, results from spring testing, um, as well as a short update on some of the learning recovery we hoped um, that we see uh, coming from the spring of last year into the fall of this year. So we're going to sort of piggyback on the data we've already shared with you over the last few months, but share with you new data that we've been able to triangulate with that data point um, to look at potential learning loss. So we're going to start actually with, and now I think this is not going to work. Is it on? Is it on? I didn't know I was going to get asked all these hard questions. <laughs> Like how to use it the does pointer. help to turn it on. <laughs> Indeed, it does work. So if it's okay, I'd like to start with the largest set of data and the one that we can all celebrate at every level, elementary or preschool, actually all the way up to high school. And that is our changes in graduation rate, looking at specifically what we call the four-year graduation rate, which means students who graduated on time in four years. In Kentucky, we also have what's called a five-year graduation rate and a combined adjusted rate. For the purposes, particularly during COVID, I thought it would be most impactful for us to look at how it impacted our students who graduated on time in four years. And if you can see, I have desegregated that by different populations of students. And what we largely found is we boast, as always, a very high graduation rate 
um, in Oldham County. That was able to sustain through the pandemic last year and also um, in actually going out of the spring of 2020. So we're excited to say that for the most part, our graduation rate remained very high. We saw a few dips in a couple of areas and actually some increases in others. I do want to point out to you that data points such as EL are extremely volatile, meaning they can go up or down drastically every year because of the sheer um, small enrollment of that population. For example, this year you're going to notice that we didn't have a data point for them, and that's because we only had seven, and you have to have 10 to count. We typically range anywhere from five to 12, and so again, don't be alarmed when you see that number go up drastically because there are very few students in that population. The second probably uh, population that you need to be mindful of that tends to fluctuate quite a, um, quite a bit or can be subject to fluctuation is that of African Americans because typically we have a very low African American population in this district and again the smaller the number the easier for that number to go up and down. And so just wanted to share that data with you, no real concerns beyond what we typically see. Um, obviously we do still have concerns that our students of poverty tend to graduate at lower rates than um, our non-poverty students. However, those graduation rates are still respectable, but still some areas that we need to target. A lot of our dis disabled students tend to do much better in the five-year rate, and because sometimes their plans simply are that they're going to graduate in five years, which is, again, another reason why the state allows for a four- and a five-year adjusted rate. So if we look at the next one, I thought we would skip right on it and go on down to high school since we've talked so much about elementary and middle over the last um, few months. I thought I would hit on high school first. One, of course, the, the proudest moments of Oldham County is in our stellar performance on advanced placement. And I know there was a lot of concern about what would happen with advanced placement courses through this intermittent um, learning and these disruptions to the school year. If you recall, those disruptions started not this past spring, but the spring before. And that really took our AP students aback because that happened in March. AP um, tests start in May. Students actually saw no deficits or declines in the 2020 year. We actually did better in some areas on AP. However, that is not what we're seeing happening with the 2021 spring results. It does appear that there is potentially learning loss as it relates specifically to COVID here. Because of these drastic declines and looking those in, at, in light of historical trends, these are pretty significant declines in the percentage of students who get a qualifying score of at least a three. Um, on an AP course. We also do see some lower enrollments, however, that could be COVID related and sometimes that's not. And they weren't huge um, declines in enrollment. Again, the more significant issue uh, was the issue of um, those students getting a passing score. So we see North Odom High here. Again, I also want to say that even though this is a significant drop, those are still extremely high pass rates. Um, when you look at districts across the nation. So we're very proud of what's happened here, but we do see some evidence that perhaps um, we took some hits with COVID or our students took some hits with COVID. Moving on to OC, you'll see a very similar trend. Enrollment down just a slight bit, but um, significant hits to qualifying score percentages. And then I'll skip right on to South Oldham High School where again you see those same sort of patterns. And so we saw those consistently across all schools. Um, the same exact pattern, and they were out of um, sequence with what we typically see in our trend data. So all in all, we could probably assume that yes, COVID had an impact on the learning loss as it relates to AP courses um, for this past school year. Before I move on, are there any questions about AP or graduation rate? Thank you. Okay, so moving on, the other college prep class that we, we tend to look at in the most recent years is that of dual credit. And dual credit's been around for quite a while. However, it just recently in the last several years became a part of our accountability model. We do see that um, we had very low enrollments in dual credit classes when they first started to come on board because the majority of our college-bound students tend to lean more toward AP. As we opened up and dual credit became more accessible, more courses were offered at all of our schools instead of isolated to just certain high schools, we see those enrollment numbers um, have really climbed for those students. What's exciting here is we did not see an impact of COVID in terms of any loss in qualifying scores and pass rates in the 2020 year, and we do not see those again this year. So we're holding steady um, and almost exactly the same enrollment pass rates. So um, that's exciting news. So dual credit did not seem to be impacted by, by the pandemic. Looking now at ACT, and we talked briefly about reading and math ACT scores when we talked about learning loss uh, in the previous two months, but I wanted to give you a big picture view of what ACT looked like 
um, for our district as a result of the intermittent and, and disruptions to learning. We did have a normal ACT administration again this past year. We um, test in Kentucky, which is unique, fairly unique when you compare it to other states in that we test all of our students, all of our juniors are tested on ACT each and every year. That is not true for all states. And so when you try to, to look at average ACT scores nationally, it really is very skewed data because a lot of states only test their college-bound highest performing students, don't test students who have, um, for example, learning disabilities, have very low test rates. And so when you compare what our district is able to do by testing each and every student, regardless of their circumstance, we still rank very highly. If we were a state, for example, this year we would have ranked 28 in terms of um, the highest 28 um, scores. And so that, again, is considering all of our students, which is much better than average. So we're really proud of those scores. We did take a dip in our average ACT scores in every area. We really took kids in two of our high schools, uh, more so than one of them. Um, and those schools have their own ACT data they're looking at, and so you are privy to see that. But we just wanted to show you a district view at this time. As a result, as a district average, we did drop in all of those areas. Probably, again, most concerning is the impact um, on our special populations, such as, such as certain races and our students of poverty and our disabled students who do tend to perform at a much lower rate on the ACT um, than the average student in Oldham County. Those numbers are there for you. You can see that we boast a composite score of a 20.7 compared to the state's average of about 18 um, and the nation's average at 20.7. So, Again, doing, doing really well compared, especially in light uh, of a pandemic, we, we feel strong about these scores and, um, and where we're going with those moving forward. Any questions about ACT? One thing you might want to keep in mind is you will be seeing, if you haven't already seen, some um, public releases of ACT data that may differ from these numbers, and sometimes people get confused. ACT publishes a report every year that considers all students who took a test during that school year. So they could have been seniors, they could have been freshmen, they could have taken it for the fourth time. This is strictly about what our juniors did. And so if you see those numbers, know that that will account for the variances for that. Great point of clarification, thank you. Okay, moving on. When we look at ACT specifically, what's more important to me um, when I look particularly at ACT data than just the average composite scores, I wanna see the percentage of students who are meeting those benchmarks because that's really letting us know how well we're preparing our students um, to go on and be college ready without remedial courses when they hit college and not need that prerequisite work. We saw, um, we did see declines this year, obviously you just saw those um, in average ACT, but the bigger declines seem to happen um, in the area of the percentage of students meeting those benchmarks. And those were much bigger declines in the area of mathematics and English than in the, other, um, yeah, mathematics and English than in the other two areas. And so that's just there to provide for you to let you see, again, pretty big jump in math. Um, in terms of a decline. Uh, we know we saw that same pattern, though, in mathematics across the district regardless of the level. So it would make sense that we also saw it here. So really nothing new, just letting you see how that trend goes across levels as students move um, through the works. I will tell you that my anticipation is this would not have been the group that would have been largest hit by the current pandemic. I think that um, our larger concern would be the population of students who take that test this year because of the cumulative learning loss as a result. So we're preparing that we need to make sure that we have lots of um, recovery efforts in place to help those students who will probably, again, uh, be at a bigger deficit when they take the ACT as a junior in March. All right, another big, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Um, Leslie, how many, how many years would you project that we're gonna see these scores like this, like how, how far down the line do you think that this is going to take us before we start going back to where we were before? And the best I can do is tell you what research Just suggests in similar circumstances. And certainly pandemics have not been one that's been largely researched in terms of um, academic excellence and that sort of thing. However, we do have research available from other countries and also within the United States when things, for example, like bad weather, inclement kinds of things happen with weather, um, that cause large-scale disruptions of schools over long periods of time. And typically what we see, famine, for example, in other countries, um, civil wars uh, that have caused schools to shut down. So most of the data you're going to see where people are trying to project exactly what you said are, are tying back to the research related to those incidents. And typically what we see is two to three years 
um, of recovery time. And that doesn't mean you're not making gains as you go. It just means in order to also probably recoup what you lost in projection, not just to stay where you were, not just to decline, but the fact that you didn't get to move forward as a result of those disruptions is what we're, is, is what we're looking at. So I think our best case estimate is to, to know that there will probably be a minimum of two to three year impact. To the degree that impact will be, we don't know, um, which is why we have we go full steam ahead on our recovery efforts in order to, to minimize that. So that's a great question, and I wish I had a better answer, but I think that's what you would hear most, most folks say. Thank you. So moving on to the next big piece is besides an academic pathway, we have in the Kentucky Accountability System career pathways as well. And we know as a district that has not been um, where most of our students have put their eggs. Most of them really, truly tend to excel more in the academic pathway and have less interest in the career pathways. We do see that that's somewhat changing um, and that will continue to change with the needs of our unique district. Um, we certainly know there's a place for career studies and that we need to, as schools get, um, get better at opening up those opportunities, particularly um, for students who aren't excelling necessarily in strictly the academic pathway. But this is just a snapshot of career pathways for you, again, to give you sort of an idea of how maybe the pandemic um, affected those particular areas. We know that career studies did take a hit in just the delivery method of the way that those courses were ha had to be delivered um, in a hybrid and in a virtual capacity. And so here's what we're looking at here. Um, you see really pretty even keel in terms of performance with the exception of our completers, which is of course where we want to get our students to be um, in terms of getting credit, for lack of a better word, and an accountability model for career. Um, the explorers are something we are seeing a little bit of a rise in, and that's simply, I think, folks uh, sort of getting their toes wet and seeing what interests them. Unfortunately, the accountability model in Kentucky doesn't give you the luxury through, through um, the way it's designed for a with a formula to, to really have a lot of exploration going on. It's really about getting students in a pathway and continuing them through there to get those credits um, to be credit worthy and move on to that field. I think what is interesting is to see um, the number of students enrolled in those pathways, which has increased from the 470 to the 548, so that is exciting. Mm -hmm. but, um, this is something obviously if you want to know more about, uh, Matt Watkins is obviously the expert here, um, but I didn't want to share uh, some of his good news with you, which is he did not, that, those programs did not appear to take the hit um, that might have been expected. Excellent, thank you. So looking now at K-PREP, and when we talk about K-PREP, we're talking about grades 3rd through 11th with the exception of grade 9. And so really what I thought I would share with you today, because this data is not comparable to previous years as a direct comparison for a couple of reasons. The first reason is the test that we gave our students in the spring was drastically shortened in order to have a shorter assessment window and give students more instructional time. That means these tests were not apples to apples comparisons. Does not mean that this isn't good data. Doesn't mean that it's not correct data. It's very correct data. It just means that it would be it just wouldn't be in our best interest to try to compare it to previous years. I did put some things up there from previous years just as a reference point, not for you to directly compare, okay? So the other big reason why they would not be comparable for most districts is that um, the federal government requires 95% uh, participation rate in a state assessment. That's just part of life. This year, the state did not reach that number and many districts did not reach that number. However, all of our middle schools were well over 96 to 97% participation. So that was not an, uh, something we had to rule out in our district. And even our high school set largely at around 94% on most, most assessments. So just looking at that, and I just wanna give you um, just a bird's eye view here. You've already seen a lot of map data from the spring. It indicated we had some extreme learning loss issues, particularly in some grade levels more than others. And it also indicated to us that math was a little harder hit than reading. Um, when we looked at K prep data to see if we saw those same trends we did, uh, it confirmed the learning loss that we saw as revealed by math, only it projected that the learning loss was, was really quite worse, to be honest with you. Um, and so again, data point, not trying to look at 2021 compared all the way back to our last normal year of 1819, but you can see there's a big difference there between the percentage of students who are proficient at level, in other words, as we move through this pandemic. Um, obviously, um, 
the best we can do is look at the data that's in front of us every day, that being our interim assessments like our MAP assessments, our pre-ACT tests that we give, and also those great formative assessments that schools give all the time throughout the school year. So this is just a point in time, it's a snapshot, but again, it is confirming uh, that the learning loss that we um, saw that we had with MAP was, uh, was realized as well. All right, before I do this next with demographics, are there any questions about K-PREP? Sorry about that. All right, so the next big question we wanted to ask is, again, how did uh, this learning loss, particularly as it relates to K-PREP, hit our special populations of students who typically struggle the most with achievement gaps with their non-comparable peers? So if we look at this, we're looking specifically at the area of reading here, um, and we're looking at all levels, elementary, middle, and high. What I tried to do is give you an indication of how students in certain demographics that tend to be uh, lower performers than their peers, how they fared out on the K-PREP. And so if we look, for example, and I'll just take you through the first row, if that's okay, and you'll have, uh, again, more time to look at this data, we can see that our white students have 56% proficiency. And if we look at our African-American students at the elementary level and our Hispanic students, we see that there is a large achievement gap between the proficiency rates of those students and um, our white students. Now, we'll also say that our white students' uh, percentages are down as well. All right, but what we're seeing here is the gap widening between um, our, our specific races and our white students. And then we do the same thing with poverty, which again is probably the most concerning data I have seen with us historically is our gap between our poverty and our poverty students in all assessments that we give. And you can see there's a huge gap between how our students of poverty performed um, and how this pandemic tended to affect them um, as compared to students who were not classified as in poverty. Not good news. No. And, and, and I'll be honest with you, we did not see any signs that we were really closing the gap before it hit. So to be honest with you, it was exacerbated by the, by the fact that we had a pandemic. And so it makes our work more difficult and, again, um, lets us know that the majority of this work is going to have to happen in the core in order to ensure that these students get what they need. And then you see the exact same trends um, for the most part with slightly lower scores in some areas in the area of mathematics, but the same sorts of issues. Probably the most concerning data I saw here was the high school poverty and non-poverty, with only 18% of our students in poverty um, being proficient at the high school level in the area of mathematics. Also kind of speaks to where we're going with those math ACT scores so, and that readiness. Okay, and so now we're going to move on really quickly to science and on-demand writing, and you know that you've noticed here I have no reference points, and that's because, again, this data is not comparable from year to year, but I do want to share it with you. And so the area of science is an area that the state has been working on with new standards for several, several years, um, and also an, uh, an assessment system trying to marry to those standards, and these are, these are very low scores, I'll be quite honest with you, but they are very typical across the state. This is, science continues to be an area of performance that Kentucky just simply has not figured out. And so while I will not lay all that at the feet of Oldham County, we certainly would love to do better than this. Um, there does seem to be quite a bit of disconnect between how we're measuring the standards and how those, measure, those standards are being perceived. So that is something Kentucky will need to continue to work on. I will tell you we boast much lower novice percentages than most places and the average, but our proficiency rates are really about where everybody else stands. We did see increases in on-demand writing last year. Um, remember, we had a shortened test. My first inclination was, were these boosts strictly because it was one prompt instead of more than one prompt? My gut wanted to wait and see what the state's average um, did and see if they also had a big boost, and they did not. So this is an interesting data point, and we did have certain schools that pulled up more than others. This is going to be um, something that schools really need to look at and say, okay, how did we get those? What did we do differently? because these do not follow the same trend of the state. And so I would not necessarily attribute this increase to the fact that it was a shortened test. It looks like there really was some um, learning expressed here that we have not seen here. These are, are really strong numbers for us, and so we're excited about um, the proficiency numbers in on-demand writing. Looking at male and female um, performance, we typically don't look at that um, at this level of the board meetings, but I thought I would throw that in, particularly at a time of learning loss, to see if we could, it, if it would reveal something about what was happening with our students. And really and truly, our data mimics what nationally has been going on for years, which are the, stu the male students tend to perform better in, in math, and females tend to perform better in reading. Um, and the exception was really the upper grades in math, where the females really um, 
performed at about the same rate, which is, is not typical. So uh, that just just something I threw in there for you to have as an extra point because we're trying to uncover and turn over every rock to look for opportunities for leverage as we move forward. And now I just want to spend the rest of the time, if it's okay, talking to you just a little bit about the recovery. And we invested a lot of resources, <coughs> thanks to the sport, a lot of resources were dedicated with federal funds um, to do extensive enrichment and recovery programs this summer, each and every school and each and every program. And so I often get asked the question, do you think it, do you think it helped? Do you think it mattered? And of course, any increase or decrease, we couldn't blame on that or attribute to that. But certainly we do see a correlation between how students ended the year in the spring and how they began this fall. So I wanted to share that with you. And again, not to say we have a direct connection and can absolutely say that, but most certainly something helped. Typically what you see is what's called a summer slide. And it's tend to get worse from the spring to the fall, but we did see the opposite. So I just want to share this graph with you really quickly um, so that you can get an idea. The first graph on the left you're going to see is a fall to fall comparison, which means it's not the same group of kids. It's looking at fourth grade this year compared to fourth grade next year, for example, right? What's typical? What's normal? You can see that we actually are at quite a bit of a deficit for what's normal. This fall, when we took the MAP test, our kids performed a lot lower than what is typical for them. Okay, so that's the learning loss that we already talked about seeing. But if I look at cohorts of students, meaning the kiddos who were third graders in the spring are now fourth graders in the fall, and we want to see if, how summer impacted them, right, and that first initial stage of instruction they got in the fall, just being around peers again and all of those social stimulus. Um, we can see that in all grade levels, with the exception of two, that being those kids going from K-1 and those kids going from 7-8, saw a big increase in their achievement percentile. So even though they saw a large increase in their achievement percentile, I want to be really, I want to caution you that that was not enough of an increase to get back to where they were and even have any kind of projection. But that's good news, meaning they weren't continuing to decline. Those students are getting better from where they were, and so we are making up some of that recovery and sound like that you talked about. The biggest concern I have in this data and also in the math that you're going to see in just a second is, are those current first graders? And we anticipated that, that virtual learning and disruptions to learning, and, and I know some principals have spoken out about some of the reasons why that's occurring. That absolutely is a concern here. Those students have really, not only did they lose ground before, they're continuing to have cumulative learning loss, which they're continuing to decline in this current situation. So we want to keep our eyes on those current first graders for sure. And then we can project that we also will have similar issues, probably not to the same extent with our, with our current kindergartners, as they are still dealing with some of their issues. So math, we see the exact same thing. Big declines in math if we look at fall to fall on a tip, what's typical. However, we are seeing some pretty good gains with again, the exception of those current first graders. It's the only place we're seeing those significant declines. And so we just want to have that on our radar that that learning type, and while it was the best we could provide, um, really has had an impact on those students, and so a lot of recovery is going to have to be targeted towards them. Any questions on these last two graphs before we wrap up? Thank you, Leslie. Um, so the last thing we have is just proficiency. The good news is, although our achievement percentiles are um, in some cases looking fall to fall going down, what we are beginning to see is our, our proficiency rates did go up for most grade levels with the exception of eighth grade, for whatever reason, taking a pretty big hit. Our current eighth graders have taken a big proficiency hit in both reading and math. And then this is the final slide, if I, if I can. We talk about this idea of, um, we just talked about achievement gaps as it pertains to um, Cape Graph and you saw the circle graphs, but I think this hopefully captures for you when we talk about the growth of an achievement gap can't just be measured um, from year to year. You have to look at what could have happened had you been able to close those gaps. If you look at the first, if you look at the top graph there, this is, so, this is poverty, students of poverty. You can see non-poverty students in 18-19 school year had proficiency rates at 72%. Kids of poverty had 46.1%. And so that was a 25.6% gap. If you look at what then happened in 2021, you can say, oh, well, that gap only grew 3%. But essentially what happened was everybody moved down. 
So now you have a gap compounded by decline, which will make sense in the grain farm in just a second. Do you see what I'm saying? The ones that were at 72 came down to 60, and now we have these, um, these kiddos who are already struggling at 46% dropping down to the 30s, very low 30s. So what I want you to understand about when I talk about the cumulative effect of learning loss is the potential gap that occurred for that happening. So if I would have kept the projection that this pandemic would not have hurt the average non-poverty kid and that they would have still scored at 72, and I would have projected that kids in a gap, we wouldn't have closed. They wouldn't have gotten any better because trend data showed that they wouldn't have gotten any better. Our real gap projection is more like 40%. That's a lot more than 28. Yeah. So that was just another way of looking at that through the lens of how projections matter. It's not just about declines. It's about that loss of being able to get better. So that concludes my presentation. If you have any questions. Excellent report. And as always, Ms. McKinney, you have made the data um, very, um, I don't want to say easy, but much easier for board members to follow. Let me ask if there are any questions. I would suggest to board members this report is complicated and if you would like more time with Ms. McKinney, I'm sure she would make that time available. Thank you. And to our principals, we don't have individual school reports, but um, we would like to have further conversation with you all when we have our site-based council reports just to talk about addressing some of the learning loss and what you're doing in your individual buildings. So um, we greatly appreciate and look forward to that time with you all. Anything you want to add, Superintendent? Just uh, one, appreciate Ms. McKinney, appreciate the report, thank you. Um, we have uh, talked uh, and continue to share with the board about how the work that we're doing, as she alluded to, with uh, our uh, COVID relief monies to support learning loss. I think the other thing is how we're uh, supporting our special populations. When you think about free and reduced, our EL students, our students who have disabilities, uh, because we know that the way that we can really uh, gain some ground is trying to uh, really improve, uh, strengthen our core instruction. Um, and also, I can't say that without saying this, I know our principals and our teachers and our staff all really uh, understand uh, the need and what we need to do. And so I think that is, you know, certainly this school year has not been uh, easy. So that creates challenges, but where everyone's aware and really appreciate the, the work that everyone's trying to do to move this forward. Indeed, and so do we. Thank you all. Um, let's move along with our agenda, Superintendent, and we are ready for the Treasurer's Report. Yes, Ms. Anderson, if you would please come forward. Thank you for being here. Good afternoon, Ms. Anderson. Good afternoon, everybody. All right, tonight we have the month of September's financials to review, and these begin on page 20. We start with the cash, the Treasurer's Report for the month of September. We began with $40,620,000 and ended with $36,358,000. Same time last year, we were a million dollars lower um, at 35.4. Uh, compared to last year, our uh, governmental funds are down a million, but our food service and daycare are each up a million dollars. So that's thanks to the grant programs um, that we've been, um, been able to use. On the second section under bonded construction funds, um, you can see the receipts uh, under there for our interest are very small. Uh, this is something we're looking at to see if we have any alternatives. Last year, um, same time last year, we were bringing in 10 times this, $4,450. So there's been a change in the markets, and so we're going to see if there's something we can do to improve that. Uh, on the following page are the cash balances of the governmental funds by um, individual fund. And the page following that are the historical uh, actuals comparison of certain accounts. Uh, as we look at this first line, our general fund revenue, um, we are up about $100,000 $100, compared to where we were same time last year. And if we look directly below that, under general fund salaries and benefits, we are up about $150,000. As we move to this next section uh, of the general fund revenues, 
you can see that um, the PSC property franchise tax and the delinquent property taxes are both up uh, considerably over prior years. If we look at SEEK program, the very last line item down there, you can see a slight increase compared to prior year, and that is because of the extra kindergarten money that we are getting. The second two sections, uh, second and third sections, capital outlay and building revenue funds are both where we predict we about 50% for the year. On the following page, we have uh, each of the revenue accounts uh, in detail, if you want to look at those. In the page following that, we've got our expenses by category. Um, as we look at our salaries, uh, this year, fiscal year to date, we're at $10,380,000. That's um, just about $100,000 over where we were last year, so that's 1% above where we were. In the next section, we've got our employee benefits, and I wanted to call your attention to one line, the uh, account 0232, CERS employer contribution. You can see the um, increases over the years. Um, between 19 and 20, there's an 11% increase. 20 to 21 is a 4% increase. That was the year that we did not have a CERS increase. And this year, we've got a 20% increase. So we've got the 12% um, CERS increase that's mandated by the state, in addition to the MAG uh, increase that affected uh, our classified employees. If we turn the page and go to um, Professional technical services, the line over 338, you can see a considerable increase. This is PD, which has been pretty quiet in the last couple of years, so we were picking up on that. Uh, as we look down a little farther to 0349, you can see professional services other, and this is primarily for um, background checks and, and E rate filing. E rate will give us some uh, revenue back on the technical side, so this is a good thing. And the background checks means we're hiring, so that's also good. In the next section are um, property services, and I wanted to call your attention to some of these utilities that we had expected to uh, go up. We've got water and sewage going up. We've got garbage going up. Um, part of the reason the garbage is that we had a $9,000 annual chemical removal. So that's a good thing. Uh, we've also got um, on the next page, 0435, contracted uh, vehicle repair. We've got bus body uh, damage at about $5,000 per month. That gives us our $17,000, so that's a, a fairly considerable cost. Uh, let's see if we turn the page. Uh, we have account 0533. This is our online network, and this is an area of good news. This is um, our internet that Trey has renegotiated and is considerably less, and this will be a benefit to us. Uh, I don't want you to be worried about the 0522 above it, where it looks like it's double. We are paying quarterly bills on this, and we pay two periods uh, year to date this year and one period uh, last time. So we'll get there. Uh, if we skip ahead to page 30, again, we're seeing some utilities. Um, we've got electricity that's high. We've also got some supplies uh, under tech software. We are seeing a 15 to 20 percent increase in prices on software and also an increase in the SLD um, software. As you go down a little farther, 065203, there's audio enhancement devices. That's money being spent on those interactive classrooms. So if we look at total supplies and materials, we are up almost $700,000 um, from prior year. There's 200,000 in electric, 325 in SLD software, and then in 140 in interactive classrooms. In this next section in property, uh, the first section under machinery, we have bought um, a, a dumpster or a compactor for uh, LaGrange. That is an expensive proposition. That's $44,000. And a um, scrubber or cleaner, which is also an expensive item at $8,000. We have our phone system at $62,000. And then our final item is a heat pump for LaGrange. In the next section, miscellaneous, we have a new item, and that is um, the Kista interest, which is on the buses. So that is new for this year. Uh, the next section on page 34 shows our expenses by function. Um, you know, one of the biggest changes is under psychology. We, we've spent considerably more um, than we did four years ago, three years ago. We started with 49000 and we're up to about 160. So it is an investment that we have made um, for our students. 
On page 37, we have our bonding potential that has not changed from last month. And then on page 38, we have our balance sheets by fund, and then our income statements by fund beginning on page 52. And that concludes the treasurer's report. Excellent. Questions for Ms. Anderson? All right, motion to approve, please. Made by Mr. Kehoe, seconded by Mr. Dodson. All those in favor, and that's by vote, you may. Uh, so I'd just like to share with the board, just appreciate uh, Ms. Anderson and her work and her diligence on, uh, uh, from a treasurer perspective and as our finance officer, uh, just uh, recognize and appreciate that. I think also to add to, we've had conversations about, from an advocacy perspective, general se uh, session will be resuming in January. So there's uh, advocacy taking place that funding all day kindergarten continues. Of course, that's still yet to be determined. Um, and I think the other thing that we have to be mindful of is continue to watch our revenues and our expenses as we, as you've heard Ms. Ms. Anderson discuss as an example, those expenses, some expenses are given to districts uh, in terms of uh, retirement uh, contributions that we have to make, which has, does have an impact. So it's something we have to closely watch. Yes, thank you, Superintendent. We certainly echo those remarks, Ms. Anderson. Thank you so much. Would you walk us through bills and claims, please? Yes, bills and claims begin on page 110. Um, uh, for the time period since our last board meeting, we've had 1,368 invoices for a total of $4.3 million. Uh, same time last year, $8.8 .8 million. And we were in the midst of a great deal of construction for North Oldham High, South Oldham High, Oldham County High, and North Oldham Middle. So those have largely concluded by this point. And uh, on the following pages are the details uh, regarding those claims, and that concludes bills and claims. And your reports still have excellent notes for board members, Ms. Anderson. We greatly appreciate that additional help. Thank you. Questions regarding bills and claims? Motion to approve. Made by Ms. Nyker and seconded by Mr. Kehoe. All those in favor, and that's 5-0. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Anderson. <coughs> Board members, it's been a busy month. Once again, we have three sets of minutes to approve. The first were the minutes from the regular board meeting from September 27th. Any corrections or additions? Motion to approve, please. Made by Mr. Dodson, seconded by Mr. Kehoe. All those in favor, 5-0. We had a special call meeting on September 30th, which was uh, our tax rate hearing, corrections or additions, motion to approve. Made by Mr. Kehoe and seconded by Ms. Nykirk. All those in favor, 5-0. And we had our monthly work session, which was October 11. Corrections <coughs> or additions, motion to approve. <laughs> made by Mr. Dodson, seconded by Ms. Nackirk. All those in favor, and that's 5-0. Superintendent, we are ready for your report to the board on personnel, sir. Yeah, just recommend to make a recommendation to the board to approve those uh, action items. Thank you, sir. We will just file that for our information. And we are ready now to approve the consent agenda. <laughs> which is items A through H with the um, corrections that the superintendent shared with us. So motion to approve the consent agenda. Made by Mr. Dodson, seconded by Ms. Uh, Hundley. All those in favor? And that's four with one opposed, with one opposed. All right, thank you, board members. Superintendent, report number one, sir. Yes, uh, so I'd like to invite Mr. Bohannon to come forward and share with the board in terms of construction projects and report and an update. Mr. Bohannon. Good afternoon. How are you doing, Steve? In your packet, you'll find uh, the construction report for October, um, and there'll be a little bit of updating there for the work that we've got completed over fall break. This report was put together before fall break. But, the uh, first two projects on there, Buckner Classroom Edition and the South Oldham High School Administrative Edition, the Jim HBC projects, uh, we're in the wrapping up stages of those projects with um, 
and finalizing some commissioning um, and some functionality and control tweaks uh, for both of those projects. Uh, the Old Town Art Center roof replacement, uh, we are still awaiting materials. I did receive a text while I was sitting here that those materials will be um, local um, November 5th. Um, so once those materials arrive on site, um, we'll coordinate that work with the capital program for the tariff from that group. So here in the next week or so, we should get going on that. The uh, Oldham County High School Foundation Repair Project, the site work continues um, on that, the stormwater drainage uh, work revisions kind of are started on that, the concrete work continues, and the um, downspout tie-ins and um, yard drains are being were put in place last week, as well as cutting across the uh, pavement there. The um, East Oldham Classroom addition, you can see the pictures there, we have a slab in place, the uh, underside plumbing is obviously completed, and they started last week on uh, placing uh, block interior walls. Um, so we're starting to go vertical with that project. And uh, also during fall break, they uh, began some of the site work um, adjacent to the uh, other, other portions of the project out front the side. So, uh, the uh, South Oldham High School field house renovation. Plumbing and mechanical electrical work continues. New thick and slabs are being placed. And the structural footings are going in for the uh, replacement of the press box. The old press box has been removed, as you can see in the pictures there. And uh, like I said, we're moving forward with uh, getting the structure in place for the new one to be once that arrives. The South Oldham Hospital Fire Alarm uh, upgrade project will be the next uh, project that we take task over there. Uh, at the building, and um, that will advertise to bid in November. Um, we'll get that work started over winter break um, when students aren't in the building, and then we'll continue on during the uh, spring semester uh, and nights and evenings with that project. Um, I want to kind of skip down here to some of the minor projects we got going on over fall break. We were able to replace carpet in the media center uh, offices and music room at Goshen Elementary School. Um, and get that back, put back together uh, last week before kids will show back up this morning. Um, uh, Dr. Radford and I have um, started discussions about um, some site beautification projects. Uh, we did a uh, tour of the campuses uh, about two weeks ago, I guess it was, um, and kind of came up with a laundry list of things that we're going to tackle. Uh, these projects will be a kind of a collaboration of in-house work, um, some uh, collaboration with other entities, and then also some contracted work. But uh, some examples of that, for example, but not including, not limited to, not including to, uh, including the uh, North Oldham campus um, pavement repairs and restriping that we've been talking about doing at all three of those schools. Um, the Buckner campus, some repaving and uh, site cleanup. Um, we'll be doing that working in collaboration with Oldham County High School and their agriculture class. The um, annex at this. The salvage yard at the annex, and um, we've already kind of started cleaning that up and uh, it's starting to look in better shape. I'm uh, going to go through that um, that process a little more in depth. Uh, the grounds department, fence row, the east campus, site lighting, uh, which we're going to tie into the construction project that we've got going on now to improve some of the, uh, the site lighting um, for pedestrian traffic coming from the uh, North Ridge subdivision. With the, um, with the increase of pedestrian traffic there, we're going to look at some opportunities to uh, Pretty much double the uh, lighting on that site. So. Um, and then, like I said, tie that into the construction project. So, this um, LED and uh, while we have that work going on in place. Um, the work on the South Campus that uh, will continue to um, make some improvements along that to tie into with the um, South High, the next couple of phases of South High. Um, but also we'll get at some um, entrance gates out of 146. Um, that um, the administration has requested um, to kind of help with some traffic flow there. And then um, some uh, center build, we've had um, some discussions with that school about um, improving and um, doing some uh, work around the playground area just to make it a little more functional for what, how they currently use it um, versus how it was used 10, 15, 20 years ago. So, um, those are just some examples of some of the things that we've uh, started to look at. Um, and then, like I said, that list will probably grow and shrink as we complete things, but it'll kind of be an ongoing project that we'll um, be focusing on as uh, we kind of move out of moment season here. We're going to free up some staff to help us out on that. Right. I know board members are pleased to see, um, especially your minor project overview. And I may note, Mr. Bohannon, that 
We are going to start um, asbestos abatement at Liberty Elementary. Yeah, we're going to try to get that started um, this winter as well. Um, we actually have a, uh, um, a spec put together for it, so we'll put it out to bid this winter. And then um, once we get that abated, then we'll uh, take the next steps forward for it. Excellent. Let That's me see fine. if there are any questions. Questions for Mr. Kehoe. Mr. Bohannon, the uh, consent item B1 and B2, the change orders for partial roof replacement and the stuff that's going on at the South Oakland High School. Pull your mic a little closer. The two uh, change orders there at uh, Oldham County and South High School. Uh, yes, sir. And closures B1 and B2. The, uh, the one for $41,000, and that's what I opposed for in the consent item, was um, should that not have been caught by the architect that sewer repair project? <laughs> Well, the what was in the original contract was to tie into the existing system, um, which was um, documented from eighty-year-old drawings. It said basically said the storm drain went through here, went through here, and connected over on the uh, far side over by the greenhouse. Uh, once we began excavating, we noticed uh, very quickly that that storm structure that was in place was basically collapsed. Um, that it was completely deteriorated, cast iron piping. Um, and in addition to that, it didn't exist the way it was in the drawings. So basically, we went from based on historic drawings what we had to had to work with, um, and then the change order that you see that the board just approved here uh, a couple minutes ago um, basically replaces that entire storm drain system from the back doors all the way out across the parking lot to daylights into the um, the sluice across the parking across the uh, back lot there. And that includes all of the downspout tie-ins, the um, existing removal, the excavation, rock removal, um, placing back new pavement. I'm um, sorry, concrete, not pavement. Are we expecting any more change orders on the project? The reason I ask, on that one particular change order, it said this, this change uh, does not require additional time to complete. The additional days have been uh, are being requested in a separate standalone change order. Yeah, there will be an additional change order for that. There is also changes to the um, mechanical yard fence line that we're in the process of getting pricing for. Uh, basically, we've come where it comes around the corner by the wood shop there, nothing too specific, but we've had to adjust the fence. Um, so it's a bigger, louver, smaller masonry fence line. Um, so there are some shifts and changes in that. Um, and I did want them to separate the time portion out into a separate change order from the cost. And then the title of the change order was OCHS Partial Roof Replacement and Foundation Repair. It's all under the same BG1 project with the state. So the, the, the roof work that was going on in the spring of this year, was that part of this? As far as, as, far as the uh, accounting process, the KD with the fact pack system, it's all it's, it's two phases of one project, or it's two bid packages of one project. That's the reason I'm asked. The, the roofing contractor was working on Easter Sunday. They had their guys up there on the roof, mm -hmm. a, a very large crew. Were we charged double ten for that? No, absolutely not. That was on the yes, sir. Okay. And they, uh, depending on which time that they were up there, they may have just been doing some correctional work, or they may have been completing the uh, contractual work. Okay. But no, we were not charged double ten for that. And then the the project itself on the, the mm -hmm. wall repair behind uh, Oldham County the gym. Mm -hmm. uh, I asked you about six weeks ago um, with the status of that. Where, where, where do you stay? These, delay, these changes that we were just discussing were the delays in that. Uh, once we started excavating there and got to the, um, the site closest to the gym is where we ran into the stormwater issues. So the, some of the delays we ran in there were the additional um, time that required to see what we had, see what we needed to do, design the solution, get pricing from a plumber, get it through the general contractor, get it to the board, get it through Katie. Actually, the kinds of approval is, is pending Katie approval because of the dollar amount of that we have to get Kentucky Department of Education approval before um, we execute that change order finalized. So, so that, that, that was a, a lengthy part of that time frame. Um, when we discussed it last month. Um, I think that I could had kind of hinted that we were running into some issues with some underground utilities. This was the major one that we were that we ran into. Thank you. Other questions, board members? Thank I'm you. glad we're keeping you busy. Thank you, Mr. Bohannon. Thank you. All right, Superintendent, we are ready for report number two, sir. Yes, so uh, in your board packet, you'll see uh, the status of the ILP, which is really a reference for myself and the seven standards that 
that we use in Kentucky. So it's there for your reference and certainly we've continued to focus on human resources as, uh, as we'll talk a little bit more tonight. Uh, we also have uh, discussed previously at previous board meetings uh, in terms of focusing, uh, maintaining a really strong healthy culture the very best we can. And I think uh, certainly with the data that Ms. McKinney presented tonight, discussions that we have, we always want to keep uh, learning at the forefront of what uh, what we're doing. So I'll be happy to answer or take any questions. Once again, you have provided excellent evidence, and you too are keeping busy. Thank you, Superintendent. Thank you. Report number three, sir. Yes, I'd like to invite Mr. Deves to come forward and share with the board an update on COVID-19 in our school district. Welcome, Mr. Deves. Oh, thanks. Um, so we want to come back, uh, and there's actually some updated numbers on the screen, and then we're in your packet, um, because the packet was done before fall break, and we were able to put some fall break numbers in as well. Uh, Mr. Davis worked his magic again and got some stuff done this morning uh, to help us with this. So uh, it is updated as of October on 25th. Um, about noon today. So we're going to run through the same numbers as we have in the past. Maybe. Hey, change that for me. Turn it off. 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 Turn it 153 middle school, 276 high school cases, 49 staff. Um, the current community incident rate is 17.3 as of uh, the last update on the board. And I don't know what the update began today at 4.30, what it went to. Um, community incident rate has decreased by 74.33% since our high of 67.4 on 9.6 of 21. And that kind of follows the curve across the state um, on the peak around that, that week time. Um, current active um, students are 13, or 0.11%, or 0.11%, of student population. If you look at our um, cases per day um, through the week's averages, um, we, our high was that same time period of 9.7 to 9.10, which goes back to the same high of 67.4 um, on the 9.6 week, um, and it has dropped to the week before fall break with 6.25 cases per day. Um, and then we're waiting for data just from the fall break piece of it. So you can see um, we've had two strong weeks before fall break and then the week of fall break. Right, uh, if you look at it in just a, a little bit of a different bar graph, we've had three weeks, or three consistent weeks from 927 to the 104 to the 1011 um, week of anywhere from five to 10 cases um, per day. So that, that is a nice um, decline from back at the 97 and 823 numbers of when we went from there. So, see from a little, little different representation. The next one is our um, tracking our quarantines. The top line, of course, is total quarantines, and then the bottom line is our school-related quarantines. Um, of course, they are correlated, but um, we're getting, we're starting to drop once again. Um, some of that's test to stay. Um, some of it's just the numbers across the county are going in the right direction as well. So we feel pretty confident with those. All right, Jane. Um, our test of state numbers, again, will start at September 8th. We currently have now had 2,853 students and staff who have completed that process. 62 of them have returned positive um, for 2,850 out of 2,853 for 2.7% positivity rate just from our test of state numbers, um, which has basically given us 2,791 instructional days back. Those are days kids would have been at home and um, I just want to give kudos to the community and parents for using that. Um, those are days that I think our community has seen our kids in school in front of teachers, and so I appreciate them using that, which is getting us close to 20,000 recovered instructional hours. Absolutely. Which is the reason we did that, is just one more strategy to keep kids in front of um, teachers. So proud of that and the, the effort everybody's put in on that. And then um, the second to last slide we're going to present is just vaccination numbers. Um, they, they're not moving, they, don't, they will not move as drastically as some of the other ones, but they're still um, in good shape. So age, our overall county is at 60.75 populated, um, vaccinated. Um, our school age kids, which are really the, really the 12 to 17 mark, some of the 18 year olds as well, um, but 53% from 12 to 15 and 16 to 17 year olds is 64%. And if you follow the news today, uh, this week, in the last couple weeks, um, 
the uh, FDA and CDC are looking at the Pfizer shot for the younger population. Don't know where that's going to land, but that would be another group that we could start to gather data on as well. And then um, the last piece is just, you know, we've really tried to expand our knowledge base and continue to work um, really close with um, our own county health department and going out into um, some of the medical field and working with Baptist Health LaGrange and several doctors at Norton Healthcare and U of L um, Health. And we've just been meeting with them two and three times. We've met with them two or three times, and we're going to meet with them again um, November 1st, um, just to get some perspective, get some more data, try to get as much information as we can. Um, it's been a really good open communication um, between those uh, four bullets up there. Um, each means about an hour, hour and a half, uh, and just it's, it's been eye-opening and, and good. Um, we review the data, the, the, we review the data on a daily basis and on a bigger um, regional perspective, and they're able to hone in on some of that for us as well. Um, and then uh, Dr. Radford has visited some other districts in Kentucky and seen what they've been doing and so forth. And we're just going to continue to discuss that with our regional partners and kind of see where we're at. So that is on what we have um, for an update from our last meeting going into fall break. If you have any questions? Excellent. I'm going to ask Dr. Radford to um, weigh in on this, but um, one point of clarification, Mr. Deves, you shared a new data point that we didn't have in our slide regarding daily average of students slash staff cases. You go back to a couple uh, slides. It's on page 453 of our agenda. Um, go back no. Two more. Let's go back another one. No. There we go. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, fall break. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Davies. We don't have any data there. All right. Um, anything to add, Dr. Radford? Just share with the board that uh, visited two, two districts. In, in addition, as Mr. Dees pointed out, we've continually to talk and discuss with uh, districts within our region, the Olbeck region. Mm -hmm. And over fall break, I visited two districts who have um, chosen as a school district to go mask optional. So I visited schools, uh, classrooms, talked with teachers, principals, uh, and superintendents, and we discussed data. So I think that's important for our board to know that in terms of really looking at the big picture and perspective in terms of what's happening within our region and other parts of our state. Excellent. We do appreciate you um, doing that on our behalf. I do want to acknowledge um, the director of the health department is with us, Mr. Matt Rose. We may at some point draw you in, Matt, to this conversation, but for now, um, we uh, appreciate you being here to, to listen. Questions, board members? Nice job, Mr. Deves. Thank you. Uh, we are ready now, Superintendent, for report number four, sir. I'd like to welcome Mr. Uh, Williams uh, to discuss uh, projections. Mr. Williams, good, good afternoon. afternoon. Um, so before you is the enrollment projection report for the 22-23 school year. As you know, we do this every year, and I update the numbers. So based on the end of the first month, um, not including preschool, we had 12,261 students um, that's 239 fewer than, than were enrolled at the end of the first month last year. Um, when you look at all of the numbers and you look at the projections and the accuracy of the projections that we had for this current school year, the five-year av district-wide average was the most accurate at 100.02% accuracy, which means I basically over-projected just slightly. Um, and then you... Yes, ma'am. And so you can look at the other specific um, projections there. 99.55 um, was the three-year school specific, which just looks at the trend lines based on the school, the individual schools. Um, when we look at all of the numbers and sort of crunch them all together, you can see that um, based on the new numbers, we would have, on the trend lines, we would have 12, in the three-year school specific would be 12,263 students for next year, which would be an increase of just two students. Um, the three-year district projection would have us at 12,266, which is an increase of five students. Um, the five-year data trend projection would have us at 12,310, which is an increase of 49 students. And then the 10-year district average projection um, would have us at 12,292, 
which is an increase of 31 students. Um, based on my years of doing this and knowing the data, I believe that the most accurate projection that we can use right now again is the five year, just like we used last year, um, which would have us growing by 49 students um, come next, the first month of next school year. Yes. And I would be more than happy to answer any questions. Questions? Nice job, Michael. Okay. And you have always hit it within about 0.02%. So good job, Mr. Williams. Superintendent report number five, sir. Yeah. Well, Madam Chair, do you have a question? On the capacity of the enrollment, um, when do when, when we uh, start looking at redistrict, redistrict, redistricting? when that number exceeds a certain point. Like I noticed um, on school capacity with the Bishop Place apartments that are coming in in Oldham County High Schools at 113.18%. When do we start looking at issues regarding capacity? In terms of redistricting, especially with high school students, we have to wait till the capacity goes. Um, much higher than that, Mr. Kehoe. And the capacity numbers are misleading because of... Join us, Mr. Deeves. Yeah, um, so high school, high school capacity numbers are they're, they're misleading in a, in a way in that um, elementary, it's, it's based on planning periods and teacher rotations and so forth. So high school can hold a higher capacity on the capacity KDE because teachers don't have to have their rooms and kids could use those rooms during planning and then we have we have students like 250 that come from Oldham County High School to the Arvin Center in different periods so that pulls kids out of the building and then we also use dual credit um, and then co-op and so there's a bunch of different ways to move kids around a high school building but if an elementary school gets to 100, 120, 130 that's going to have a very different feel than a high school being at that, at that point. And so it really just, you got to look at it that way and not just at the overall number. Um, each, each school is a little bit different that level. And then KDE has a whole template on you know, how to use that as well. And, the, and that capacity word is, is kind of a misnomer. It is the capacity as, as per KDE's calculations for a school assessment, not for how many kids you can fit into a building. Um, obviously, even as Mr. Deese was saying, at the high school level, there's uh, extended opportunities for kids to be outside the building. But that capacity number also is only calculated based on standard classrooms. So you're not counting science classrooms, you're not counting gymnasiums for PE and stuff, but you're not counting any of those type of other than standardized classrooms. So that is what drives the standard KDE capacity number. And then what uh, Mr. Williams does is take that number to use and then put actual student bodies in that. Um, so the comparison isn't exactly apples to apples, um, but even at middle school and elementary school, we're only calculating on standard classrooms. So there are there is a kind of a variance between what is actually available um, as and how it looks on a KD. But when we do the district facility plan and when we do, um, bring the local planning committee together, that is something that we take into consideration when we calculate actually how many how much room we have in a building versus the capacity versus population. Does that make sense? It, it does, but I didn't see anything in here related to COVID capacity as well as the COVID spacing increase that capacity no. issues? Those, no. I keep my name up. No. <laughs> most of those things, most of those numbers are from uh, the calculation formulas are from the um, CARA in 1990, so they wouldn't have any. I appreciate the discussion, Mr. Kehoe. I mean, there was a, a point in time many years ago, I know that Mr. Deeves and probably Mr. Bohannon was our facility director or our assistant director at that point. We were receiving anywhere between 300 and 500 new students a year, which meant we were growing basically to the point where we had to build a new school every year, although those kids didn't all come, say, at elementary or middle level. But um, this uh, projection gives us plenty of time and plenty of room um, to, to uh, anticipate any further growth. So thank you both for your um, input. Other questions? All right, Superintendent, I think we have one more report. <laughs> no, we have two more. Um, 
Report number five, sir. Yeah, I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Webb to come forward and share uh, with, about bus purchase. And you got to take with that. Hello, Mr. Webb. Good Uh, what, what we wanted to do uh, initially, first off, is for Ms. Nykirk's uh, benefit and for uh, Dr. Edford's benefit, kind of go over what we, we discussed last year as we, we, we basically put together a plan, a purchase plan for purchasing buses for the next, oh goodness, 20 years, I think. Um, so, well, that's workable. All right, so currently we have 190. We have 190 buses in our fleet. We have way more buses than what we need. Um, we have not surplus buses in quite a while. Um, we are currently looking at surplusing 30 buses. Uh, hopefully, we'll, we'll have those up in November. Um, over the next five years, if we go as planned, we will surplus an additional 72 buses. Wow. So, over the next six, we'll get over. We'll, get rid of over well over 100. Over the next eight years, we'll actually have another 40 we'll tack on to that. So we're looking at about 141 buses moving out of our fleet. Um, KDE recommends that we basically roll over our fleet every 14 years. Um, we, that's, we get KDE pays us 14 years in depreciation in you know, a reduced, reduced amount each year. Um, but we, we receive funds for each of those buses for 14 years. Um, they also recommend that we replace an equivalent of 8% of our fleet every year. So basically, that's where we're trying to go. We're trying to get back to that number. So we're not, this past year we bought 15 buses. Um, this year we're asking for six. Next year, we're, we're bumping that back up to 13. Eight. Eight, and 13. Eight and 13, I apologize. So that's kind of where we are right now, the, the state of transportation as far as our bus inventory. So do you have any questions at that point? So when we surplus them, uh, do we sell them, receive any money for those surplus so, buses, Mr. Talk about the state of the buses we're surplusing. So basically the, the buses that we're surplusing right now, the 30, I would say better than half are not money. Um, I mean, they're just, we've run them into the ground. Um, the reason we still have many of those is we're able to use parts off of those to, you know, repair our other older buses. Um, so I would say, you know, for like a, just grabbing a 2006, which is the most current bus that we can serve on, uh, we're probably looking at between 60, for 500 to 7,000 per bus um, in running condition. We've got some of our buses that will be surplusing that will just be going for sheet metal or parts. Um, those, you know, a thousand or two thousand dollars maybe. Understood. So. Thank you. Other questions, board members? Is all that surplus money going back into the purchase of the buses? I would assume so. Mr. Dunn. No, it's not going to be. Into the general fund. Yeah. So, but that's where that's where we are with that. And then, you know, our recommendation this year, I believe that is in your packet, is to purchase um, six buses. Uh, we're looking to get purchase three of the rear engines again, the large capacity, and three of our special needs buses. Our uh, reason again that we're going for the special needs is um, even our buses that were made back in 2010, 2011, the lifts are not strong enough to pick up today's newer wheelchairs. Um, wow. We just struggle with that. Um, so that's why we're looking to increase our number of special needs buses. Yeah, interesting. 
Thank you, uh, Superintendent. Yes, yeah, Mr. Webb, thank you for sharing that report. Um, something to add and share with our board. Ms. Anderson and I have had several discussions about, as you see, our replacement cycle that Mr. Webb just shared in terms of six, eight, it goes up to 13, looking at how we can be well positioned to be able to accommodate that in a, in a very efficient, effective manner when we think about revenues and expenses. So uh, more, to, more to come with that, but I think it's important for the board to know that we're having those conversations, how we can support transportation. One other point is uh, the state approximately uh, funds transportation in our district about 55% of our transportation costs. So 45% of the transportation costs has to come out of our budget. It's not funded from the state. I say that because that's another huge, big um, advocacy point going into the general session uh, starting in January for the state to, to pick, uh, at least support that, uh, increase that support from 55. Certainly the ask is 45, but we'll see what happens. Thank you, Superintendent. And I like to take every opportunity that we have with you before us, Mr. Webb, to thank you and everybody who works so diligently in the Transportation Department. We, we really appreciate your um, over-the-top efforts to get our students to and from school safely. Thank you. Superintendent, report number six, sir. Yeah, I'd like to invite Ms. Anderson to uh, come forward and share a report on a one-time fringe benefit for Oldham County employees as we made the amendment to the agenda of earlier this is in consideration of full-time and part-time employees. Welcome back, Ms. Anderson. Thank you. I think you guys have heard us talk several times about the money that the other districts have gotten from ESSER and some of these other programs that have allowed them to give their staff substantial um, benefits to their uh, to their wages. And while we were not given that amount of money, we certainly want to recognize um, the work that these folks have done for us. These folks who've been here for many years, who will be here for many years to come. Uh, and in understanding that uh, and what our budget situation is, we did want to uh, come up with uh, a schedule uh, and a payment that would be um, done in December that would um, provide some benefit to those folks. So what we're looking at is a one-time fringe benefit bonus payment to be determined as follows. 1500 gross per full-time employee and uh, certain probationary employees, a $750 gross pay per, per part-time employee. Um, and we've been kind of specific on this because we've expanded it from the fringe benefit that we gave out two years ago. That was only for full-time employees and we wanted to expand that group of employees. So we have um, also included part-time employees this time, um, those who are paid by uh, standard invoice um, during the regular instructional days. Uh, in order to meet the conditions to be eligible, uh, a full-time employee must be um, on full-time status as of November, November 15th, 2021, to be considered part-time. An employee must be on part-time status as of November 15th of 2021. Probationary employees must be hired by November 15th. And uh, in order to receive this payment, uh, because it's anticipated with the December 15th payroll, uh, the folks need to be an active employee as of Monday, December 13th. There are some groups who are not specifically identified above and they will not be eligible at this time for this particular payment. And some of those include the paraprofessionals, coaches, sponsors, substitute teachers, community-based instructors, and student workers. As we were working through how we were going to implement this, we did notice that some uh, retirees may not be eligible for this payment or they might have to just receive it and pay it back. So we will be contacting those folks individually to work out uh, what we want to do. So the recommendation is to approve, approve this one-time bridge benefit bonus as part of compensation for current school employees. And that's an awesome report. I'm wondering if my school people <laughs> already had this information or did this come as a happy surprise we will take action on it in just a few minutes and then you can applaud <laughs> because 
Well, this is not going to um, close the gap between salaries with the Oldham County employees versus any adjacent counties. I have said many times this board is committed to make some endeavors to appropriately compensate our staff and to try to close that salary gap as best we can. So thank you, Ms. Anderson, for all your work on this. Let me see if anybody has any questions. Ms. I Hundley. Have, I have a question. Um, just the fact that you pointed out certified retirees, why would they get this if they're retired anyways? Because they may be considered full-time. They come they're currently. Yeah, they, they come back to work. Okay, we've thank got, you. We've got a couple of principals who've come back. There's other people who come back to teach. Okay. Just wanted to specify. Thank you. That's a daily wage threshold too. Oh. It limits how much we can pay. Yes. Um, any other questions you all? Superintendent? Just really appreciate everyone on the team when this has been uh, in the works for several months as, uh, as our, um, everyone is aware and just appreciate the team and the diligence in trying to make all this come together because there's been many conversations and as you can imagine, a district our size and ensuring that we're addressing all the needs and uh, accounting for all of those uh, all those pieces that we need to think about when we think about our employees. There have been many people working on it. One small step in the right direction. Thank you, Ms. Anderson and Dr. Radford. And we are ready now for public expression. Mr. Dodson, do you have the um, our policy for guiding public expression, sir? Will you go ahead and share that? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Um, the request has been made to take a five minute break, and so we will happily do that, but let's reconvene in five minutes. Thank you all. Okay, we're going to roll on. Thank you all for indulging us with that little break. Um, it is time for public expression, and Mr. Dodson is going to read that uh, policy for our benefit. The board will designate a portion of the meeting to hear public comment regarding areas under the board's jurisdiction. Persons wishing to speak shall sign in with the register and review the policy on making public comment. The board chairperson or designee will read aloud the public expression guidelines. Speakers should register by signing the sign-in sheet on their arrival to the meeting, the board will call upon speakers in the order in which they signed in. <coughs> speakers shall not exceed the time limit allotted by the board. The board will allocate, allocate a time based on the number of individuals registered to speak. We've got 15. What's, your What's the pleasure of the board? We have 15 persons signed in. Three minutes. Is that the consensus? Three minutes then. Public criticism of individual staff members and individual board members is prohibited. Concerns about individual staff performance shall be addressed with the staff member directly or his or her immediate supervisor or the board chairperson respectively. Public expression is not a question and answer period. Any questions expressed by the speaker will be noted with directives for appropriate administration to follow up. The board, however, reserves the right to respond when appropriate or necessary. Now, as we did last time, when a person's speaking, you'd allow them to speak. After they speak, you can applaud them. But while anybody, I don't care what side you're on, you need to be heard, we need to hear. So the first speaker is Denise Watts Wilson. And Denise is in LaGrange. We have been asked to um, announce where people are from. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> Thank you. The last time I was here, I did not quite get to finish my comments on the oath of offices that are taken in the preambles to the Constitution that a school board is expected to uphold, and so I would like to finish where I was. I was reading the preamble to the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Kentucky, which reads, we the people of the Commonwealth of Kentucky, grateful to Almighty God for the civil, political, and religious liberties we enjoy, 
and invoking the continuance of these blessings do ordain and establish this Constitution. Invoking the continuance of these blessings implies the recognition of deity when we gather to accomplish what we do. And as we open public expression, I would like to invoke the continuance of blessings. So God, we thank you for this time. We apologize for daring to believe that we can operate a country that took divine providence to establish without honoring the one who led in the establishment. So now we ask as we enter this next session of this meeting that we will hear your voice and heed your guidance so that we might be the school district you ordained us to be. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. Amen. And my final comment, uh, I did post a video because I was not able to make comment in the meeting last month. I received a response that said I, that um, you hoped that I understood your right to vote as you do. And I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, your right is your responsibility to vote to uphold the constitutions of the United States and the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Thank you. Thank you. Shannon Stalker from Crestwood. Apologize, we only have five. Cassie's gonna hand something to you, and I know Cassie's listed after I am, and ours kind of go together. And if it suits you all, we'd like to just kind of. There are two things I think everybody in this room can probably agree on. One is that we all are here because we want to protect the kids, and the second is that masks suck. None of us like them. But it's not quite time to abandon them yet. Vaccines are not authorized for kids 12 and under. We know that once they are, the Pfizer vaccines are at least three weeks apart, and then it takes another couple of weeks for them to be effective after that. Everyone just went on vacation, and we know that spikes happen after people travel. COVID's still a threat. I'm thrilled, as everybody is, that the numbers are going down and they're going in the right direction. And we are all hopeful that we can get to the place where masks are optional. But we're just not there quite yet. Kentucky's seven-day average for cases last week was 1,739. When the health department recommended the mask mandate at the beginning of the school year, the seven-day average was 1,801. Those numbers are nearly identical. It's not time yet. I imagine that the board is probably about as fatigued with this topic as my family is. Last night, Cassie had a panic attack, wondering if, yet again, she was going to have to think about possibly not being able to go to school because of the masks. She knows numbers are going down, and we all know that that's happening because what we're doing is working. But she also knows that we just had fall break. She knows that while most of her friends were at the beach or at the mountains or out of state with friends and family, she was in the hospital for two full days of testing, including an MRI to see if her brain tumor had grown, including a four-hour kidney test, including an audiology test, including a meeting with the oncologist, and including a meeting with the endocrinologist which revealed that she may have damage to her ovaries from the chemo. She knows that she was at the hospital at, at the same time as two other Oldham County students undergoing similar treatments. And she knows that her brother still has to go to school with kids who aren't yet eligible for the vaccine. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the next speaker, Cassidy, so they, they get time together. I know most kids aren't immunocompromised like me, but I also know I'm not alone in this community. My family's not suggesting that masks should be forever. 
Nobody wants that. But we do want to follow the science. Right now, five of the states with the highest case rate are also five of the states with the lowest vaccination rate. We know vaccines will be available for other kids soon. And when that happens, we will implore parents to get their kids vaccinated. But for now, I still need your help to get where masks can be optional. We want to get there, but it's not time yet. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Nina Pans or Thames from LaGrange. I hope I didn't damage your name too bad. <laughs> no, you didn't. It was completely okay. Um, yeah, Welcome. My Hi. My name is Nina Paris. I'm a junior at the Oldham County High School. And recently, my um, English teacher resigned. And I feel as though the administration did not do its part in helping um, <coughs> her and defending her against some pretty radical Facebook posts that were made. And I don't believe that it was right. And when she sought to um, have help from her administration, then she was not offered that help and was declined. And they said nothing. And it was unfair. And I don't see how the administration could expect to have more teachers underneath their faculty when the faculty cannot trust that they will be um, defended in the same way that um, this teacher was. So that's basically <laughs> Nina, we appreciate you appearing, and I am going to share your information. If you haven't already talked to the administration at Oldham County High, perhaps you and, and some of your peers would like to do that. That's really your best avenue for recourse. Yeah. We'll make sure somebody follows up with you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Steve Hay from Prospect. Good afternoon. Hello. On July 31st, Oldham County Schools sent out an email detailing a COVID operational plan in which masking for students and staff was optional. On that day, the average daily case rate for Oldham County was 21.8 cases per 100,000. Today, the average daily case rate for Oldham County is 16.9 cases per 100,000, meaning our current rate is 23% lower than the last time this board signaled their intent to make masking optional. After 18 months, it's time to take the masks off our children. A few other points worth noting. The Warren County and Clark County data, which has widely been used as a basis to support Oldham County's mask policy, fails to note the incidence rate in those counties increased by 236 and 185% respectively, 14 days after the mandate went into effect. Cases skyrocketed, yet quarantines went down. Not, a not as a result of masks being effective, but instead because the policy was written to lengthen the distance of enforced quarantine from three to six feet of masks were worn. Oldham County's test to state policy has generated data showing roughly 97% of quarantines were keeping healthy kids from attending school. Fleming, Breckenridge, and Gallatin counties have recently gone mask optional, and those districts have recognized the flaws in quarantine protocol and are therefore allowing tests to stay for any student identified through contact tracing, not just those wearing masks. Lastly, a number of counties in Kentucky went mask optional on September 17th, and cases in those districts decreased between 37 and 54% over a 30-day span, right in line with Holman County's 47% decrease over the same time frame. On June 26, a survey was sent out to Holman County parents regarding school COVID policy. Are the parents' voices from that survey being used as a basis to make the decisions, or are we following the ever-changing guidance dictated to us by unelected bureaucracies who don't take into account community-level data? For decades, Oldham County has been a leader in the state in regards to public education. We can join a list of other counties in the state who have already decided that 18 months of masks is enough. Now that our current incidence rate is 23% lower than the last time you issued mask guidance to the optional, it's time to unmask our kids. Thank you. Thank you. 
Dave Clem from Goshen. I'm here tonight because I'm concerned with your decision making. I don't envy your positions, but at some point you must look into a mirror and think, boy, we got that one wrong. Let's start at January 11th, 2021, when this school board voted to continue to keep schools closed to in-person learning after the governor approved it. Meanwhile, learning loss, as we learned earlier tonight, continued to compound. We now know that was the wrong decision. Kids should have been in school the whole time. Next is the quarantines and the six-foot rule. As we learned a few weeks ago, the six-foot rule is completely made up out of thin air. At the beginning of the school year, OCS was penalizing healthy children by forcing them to quarantine for weeks at a time at an estimated rate of three to one sick to, or I'm sorry, three to one healthy to sick, healthy kids to sick kids, all while kids were masked. Turns out 98% of the quarantine kids ended up negative for COVID. This is a textbook case. A textbook case of the cure is worse than the disease. Yeah. I applaud the test to stay program, but why wasn't it done sooner? That's a legitimate question, right? We know it was wrong to quarantine the excessive number of kids that we've been doing. Recently, this board unanimously selected a highly divisive school board applicant, an applicant who was found to have numerous new women on his business website and extremely questionable social media behavior and content. We don't need controversial leaders or politics in our schools. We need to do what's best for our children. And this decision that you guys made to select him was a major red flag in that end. Once again, we know that that was the wrong decision. And by the own admission of this board, the situation was avoided. And lastly, the mask debate. I challenge each and every one of you sitting here today to finally right the wrongs. See, we are not anti-vaccine or anti-masks. We want a choice. My six-year-old has not been to school ever without a mask on. One size does not fit all. And forcing kids to wear a mask all day is once again the wrong decision. If you can't end the mask ma mandate today, tell us what success looks like. We have seen enough of the mandated failures. How much longer will it be until we learn how detrimental masks have been to our children? We have listened to medical professionals in this very room discuss the physical, social, emotional, and mental stresses we are putting on our kids for a disease that is largely insignificant to their health. So I'll ask, I'll end this by asking them, look yourselves in the mirror and start making better decisions. Our community, our kids, and our schools depend on it. Thank you. I do want, I have three different things, two regarding the mask and one separate issue. Um, 824, the superintendent of Christian Academy Schools sent out a letter to their parents, and he said in order to, quote, correspond to the current CDC guidelines, face masks are not mandatory. Not sure how we're getting such different interpretations of what the CDC guidelines are, but since then, it's been two months since they've been masked optional. At the English Station campus, they have 1,712 students, Currently today, they have three positive cases, zero cases in their other campuses. So maybe if zero is our goal, maybe lifting the mask might be the best option. Um, number two, in regards to the policy that you guys are thinking of and considering coming up with, I would just ask that you not create rules to prop up other rules. It seems like it's just a dog chasing the tail. We've got to do three. If we don't do three feet, we've got to do six feet. If we don't do masks, we've got to do this. If we don't do test it or we do test today, we have to ask all of these different rules. They all just are there to prop each other up. Let's just cut the rules out that are unnecessary. Let's use a little bit of logic when we come up with this policy. Number one, let's not discriminate our kids based on if they're vaccinated or not vaccinated. That's one of the worst policies that we've had in this entire process. And I've seen it in 
25 different school policies, that there's different rules for a vaccinated kid versus an unvaccinated kid. And the CDC clearly says you can still catch the virus and spread it if you've gotten the vaccine. So let's just stop that nonsense and cut that out. The last thing I'm going to say is to um, talk about the public expression time. So um, last month was a really volatile meeting. We had some recruitment happening from the district attorney, so there was a large turnout of the pro maskers, and of course we're always here um, um, talking for uh, speaking in favor of mask option and mask choice. But it doesn't matter what we say because right when we're done with public expression, Mr. Radford, you give your recommendation and there's a PowerPoint up there and you guys all vote unanimously. So what was the point of public expression? Do you hear us? Are you listening to us? I don't know how to make that solution, um, how, how to come up with the solution there, going into closed session, pretending like you're talking about and discussing an issue before you vote on it. I don't know. Uh, but throw us a bone. Make it seem to us at least that you are considering what we're saying to you in our public expression time. Thank you. junior at OCHS and school is not a safe place. Three weeks before fall break happened there were a lot of fights, one in which two of my friends were in. They were attacked by another junior whom which um, had no had no punches thrown at her and as you can see that is the pictures I gave you are the aftermath of one of my friends being hit and nobody decided to jump in until after she was already beat. Um, Mental, a lot of the schools like to say that they consider mental health um, and say that they want to help other students and say that they're there for those students with mental health. But nobody was there for me when I sat in a waiting room for six to, from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. Nobody was there when I was stripped of my rights as a human being, forced to wear scrubs and go into bed at night hearing a 10-year-old boy screaming because he was being put on a restraint bed. The school didn't help me, the school put me there. And allowing this, the, the students that have hurt other students to come back, not taking into consideration of the victim's mental health state, is wrong. And they should take that into consideration when allowing students to come, to come back. Lou, Lou, I'm going to tell you the same thing I told Nina. Um, the first place to start with your follow-up is with the school administration, and we will make sure that they follow up with you. I am very sorry for uh, what you've been through. Bethany Shoemaker from LaGrange. Hello. Hello. I've spoken here before. Um, again, I'm a wife and a mother of three. My girls are graduates of OCHS, and my son is currently a senior at OCHS. I should be able to choose, along with all the other parents, whether my son will wear a mask or not. I'm raising my voice because the government and the local authorities are robbing us of our freedom a little bit at a time. I stand for our God-given freedom to choose. I, I stand for mask choice. Thank you. Thank you. Amy Wilborn from LaGrange. Good evening. 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 Good evening.
Um, first, I'd like to point out that there are 21 school districts in the state who have created math optional programs and more are coming, including Warren County, which you guys have pointed out several times to us, is a county that you are following. Um, they're going on November 1st. Um, to review, Ms. Fletcher, in August, and I quote what you said in the meeting, um, you said, I don't think any of the board members here would argue the efficacy of masks. We understand there are no peer-reviewed articles about the efficacy of masks. What we are bound to which I have said many times, is the guidance from the OC Health Department and the QT restrictions coming from the state level. We are bound to follow these guidelines. We said before school started, we would follow the data daily and review the face mask policy in three weeks, of course. Since that time, we've reviewed on September 27th with the recommendation to stay as is with masks. Um, you did also mention that fall break may cause those numbers to increase. I would like to also point out, as already pointed out, we've dropped 74%, and most people who go on fall break trips go to southern states where they peaked way before we did. What's the chances of us actually bringing something back? But we'll see. I understand it's to the board's advantage to be ambiguous. Well done on being less than transparent on this matter. Without gold posts, we can just wait and see and continue to wait and see and wait and see every month at these school, school board meetings. Um, I am encouraged to hear that uh, you visited a couple of school districts where they have made changes to their mitigation. Um, that's encouraging. But what I'm frustrated with right now is that I see lots of interaction with the board on things such as budget and construction projects and every time something comes up about this mask issue, you sit there and ask no questions, no dialogue. It makes me wonder if there is, is there anything that's going to be done? Um, I implore the, the board to consider your lack of action and words in regards to this topic. Please begin some genuine dialogue. Your lack of words in these meetings speaks volumes to us as constituents. At the September board meeting, when Ms. Fletcher asked the board if they had any questions for Radford, nothing, absolutely not one question in the silence. So why aren't we observing any discussion on creating a plan for moving out of this mitigation? Why isn't there one board member asking about goalposts? Why are you not discussing metrics or a site or SB1 plan for moving to a math choice? Amy, time's up. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. I am, well, you guys know I'm over the masks and over for a long time, which is a ball game for homecoming. Nobody was wearing a mask, and there were a lot of people there. We had so much fun. One of my kids, first time he's ever been to a ball game in his life, had a blast, got a hot dog. Um, <laughs> But I'm here to talk more about, because I hope you guys are going to solve that problem tonight. That's my hope. That's my, please, I'll get on my knees, I'll call across the floor. Please, fix the problem tonight. But um, the thing I want to talk about tonight is the student education um, thing that you guys are considering sometime in the future. We don't know how much it's going to cost, and they're not going to negotiate, and blah, blah, blah. And one of the things that she said the other night when we were here on the working meeting was um, they have a systemic system so that nobody can intercept it, it will always be able to um, continue on and not be distracted from the plan by the noise of the district and that it will give parents a voice. I've had a voice all summer. I don't feel like I have an ear, <laughs> right? And so I'm really wary, and I think a lot of people in the community are as well, of a systemic system that comes in and gives parents more of a voice and still no ears. So. I would suggest that we work together more openly, right, with a give and take that's more open and more transparent, rather than pay more money to another systemic system that comes in and separates us further and creates a barrier between what we can accomplish as a team in the future. 
and um, I appreciate that you guys do listen to us. I know it's not something that you necessarily have to do, and um, I thank you for that. And please, please, please listen to us because we are out there at the ball games. We're at the soccer matches, the volleyball matches. We're everywhere. We're talking to our friends, and we're not afraid. Okay, and we've been through COVID, and we survived, and we're ready to go on with the regular world and the regular life and get back to regular normal, not new normal, regular normal. It feels weird to see my kids in math. It feels weird to see you guys in math. Thank, Thank you, Lee. Chances in which death itself was not a chance at all, but a certainty. 
This is the first point to be made, and the first action to be taken is to pull ourselves, ourselves together. We are all going to be destroyed by a virus. Let that virus, when it comes, find us doing sensible and human things, praying, working, teaching, reading, listening to music, bathing the children, playing tennis, chatting to our friends over a pint and a game of darts, not huddled together like frightened sheep and thinking about viruses. This may break our bodies, a microbe can do that, but they need not dominate our minds. It's time to give parents back a choice with their kids. If you choose to, give, to send your kid in a mask, great. If not, great, it's your choice. If and when vaccines become eligible for kids under 12, that again is a parent choice. It should not be mandated. This comes from a nurse of 13 years. This came in times of. Thank you. such a problem that they are trying to come up with a new way to sterilize. And they're, they're looking at developing low temperature plasma technology. Now these are masks being worn for a few hours by adults. And we have children wearing cloth masks for maybe eight, nine hours a day, including the best bright. And these masks may or may not even get washed that night. So what kind of E. coli contamination are we talking about here? This study shows the, the microscopic pictures of before and after, and they're crawling with E. coli, crawling with them. It's, it's very dangerous. Um, NIH just published a study, it's a compilation of studies that, uh, that show that the masks are extremely dangerous for many reasons. They increase blood pressure, uh, they can cause permanent damage, psychological as well as physical. But the main thing is they, they confirm that the masks do grow E. coli, they grow many types of bacteria, they grow fungus, they grow yeast, and the worst part is the study found that the masks act like nebulizers, and they actually spray this out 380 times as many small particles with a mask on than without a mask on. And keep in mind these particles have been growing E. coli. So when a teacher is speaking to a student, or teachers are speaking to each other with a mask on, they're actually spraying bacteria, yeast, and fungus into each other's eyes, into each other's hair, onto each other's clothes, onto each other's masks, where their bacteria can marry. In 2008, NIH published a study where Anthony Fauci said that the real cause of most of the deaths in the Spanish flu was a bacterial pneumonia. It wasn't the virus, it was bacterial pneumonia. And I know we have antibiotics now, but that really says something. That study didn't specifically mention the masks, but um, respiration is a two-way thing. You breathe out, but you also breathe in. So that means that our children are inhaling E. coli. Our children are inhaling these funguses, these uh, many types of bacteria. So your mandatory masking is forcing our children to inhale E. coli. That's sickening. That's inhuman. It, it's abusive. How can you continue this? Now, uh, we recently um, had a, a former uh, Oldham County School Board member speak for us, and I asked him, can the local board, the Oldham County Board, operate independent of the State Department of Education or the State Education Board? And he said, no, not really. And I thought, that's a problem. That's a politically appointed board. You guys are our elected representatives. We count on you to take care of the children. Hello, good evening. Welcome. 
Uh, none of us want anyone to be sick. We don't want to be sick. But we do know that illness will always be, has always been, upon earth. Is it possible, these are rhetorical questions, okay? Is it possible that our own data can be skewed? Are each of us able to view things differently? Is it possible that all we hear is not accurate? Is everything that we read or see on the news or see on Facebook or Instagram, is that true? Has it always been true that parents are solely responsible for their kids? Has it always been the responsibility of parents to make any and all medical and health decisions on behalf of their kids? Why then would this be different? When did anyone outside of the child's parents begin to believe that they hold the power over decisions for their children? I am not a doctor, but I've never had to be a doctor to make decisions for my children. Please stop making choices that parents should be making. Please return the respect due to parents to decide on behalf of their children. The science is obviously lacking. It may be skewed one way or the other. One day it's this way, the next day it's this way. The children are suffering. Please stop putting the children in this position. Our future and psych psychiatric well-being depends on it. Thank you. Is there anybody that wishes to address the board that did not have an opportunity to sign in? All right. Tell the audience again who you are. My name is Claire Worth. I'm from Prospect, Kentucky. Claire. These What's are not public. What's your last name? Worth. W I R T H. Okay. These are not public schools. These are government-run schools. If these were public schools, then public opinion would matter like that of Dr. Mary Rutherford, who worked for NIH and along with Dr. Fauci. And it was her advice that said that these masks were not only unhelpful, but they were harmful. And the board's response to her was that she was being divisive. And that led me to believe one thing, that you do not actually care about the health of these children. You care about the money that's attached to the back of each and every child in this county. That's all I have to say. We don't usually, as you know, it's not an answer, a question and answer period of time. I'm going to take the opportunity, Ms. Worth, to actually correct you in the fact that it's Dr. Molly Rutherford, not Mary Rutherford. And we have listened to her very carefully, and nobody it's said. Like Mary's her first name, Mary. This is not a, a conversation, but she has referred to herself as a Molly. And we have listened to her. This is why we don't try to have a conversation. Here. Yeah, because you can. Um, we've listened to her and we've received a lot of emails, and I don't think anybody has referred to her as being divisive. We certainly respect her. So I just needed to clarify that for the record. Um, I want to give Mr. Rhodes any any interest in responding, Matt. Sure. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. <clears throat> My name's Matt Rhodes. I serve as director for the Oldham County Health Department. And you know what everyone has said here tonight? It, it largely is true. The simple fact is. There's no perfect answer to this scenario. In many cases, there's not even a good answer to this scenario. But uh, as the director of the health department, not only have I tried to be protective of health, uh, because largely, as people have shared, most of, most of the time, children fare very well against COVID. They have very mild to moderate cases. Unfortunately, you have some that are immunosuppressed who don't fare well. And thankfully, the numbers are declining and going down at a very significant rate. And you know, we're seeing some very positive uh, 
data variable is related to that. And in the sense of trying to be proactive here as the director of the health department, we initiated a test to stay strategy that wasn't approved by CDC or the Kentucky Department of Public Health because we knew that there were some harms associated with quarantines. We also felt that the risk of mass-to-mass -mass transmission was very low, and we knew that the only way we would get the test to stay strategy approved is by having universal masking. So it's a very daunting and challenging situation. I would say that we're headed in a very positive direction. The group that Dr. Radford mentioned earlier was a, a group of clinicians that he convened um, outside of my guidance, but in meeting with them, I asked them, I said, you know, as a public health director, we often operate further upstream. We want to try to prevent disease, whereas clinicians look at it from a perspective of therapeutic interventions after someone has disease. So I asked them, I said, I respect and appreciate contrary opinion, but given what you know, what you see happening in the hospitals, would you advise us to do anything different with regard to masking in the schools in Oldham County? And all three of those clinicians to a person said, absolutely not. I would encourage you to continue on until you get to a safer state. We're heading towards that safer state, and I really feel like that we're going to be there soon. And I think that it's something that Dr. Radford may be working on with regard to a decision matrix. I'm not sure if there's anything that's been published, but that's something that we have been discussing and trying to get to a point where we can get out of masks. Because trust me, I want to get out of masks just as much as anyone else. But I do feel like they prevent the transmission of this disease. In fact, we've had real world scenarios where we've seen examples of individuals be COVID positive, meet in person mask to mask, and no one else in our organization actually converted positive. And they met for, in some cases, hours on end. So I think that that in and of itself speaks to the fact that they are protected. The challenge here is that, um, as everybody has stated, what's the end game? And I don't think that we'll ever get to a zero risk scenario. So at some point, you all have the authority and we'll have to make the decision as to where you think that risk is acceptable to take. Uh, as the authority that provides guidance on this issue, I don't feel like we're there yet. I feel like we're heading in that direction and hopefully very soon we will be there where we can say mask optional is a, is a direction that we should go. Uh, today as the Director of Health, I feel like that's a bit too premature. So I'll answer questions if you have any. We appreciate your remarks. I'm going to put you on the spot, Mr. Rhodes, and this is kind of unusual, but I think you can respond to this. What we um, continue to hear largely um, from public expression is the question of choice. And I understand that when you're trying to decide certain things for your children, but from a public health perspective, does my choice for my children impact other children in school? Most definitely. And, and the real challenge is when we're looking at it to provide guidance, we can't just look at it from a single variable. We have to look at the entire system and how those individual children might impact their family members or others in the community, but then also how this may impact the hospital system and what type of capacity. Thankfully, the capacity is starting to increase, but just as uh, recent as three weeks earlier, the capacity was at 100% for ICU capacity here in Region 3. Not there, is available. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, we allowed you all to speak he is speaking right now, so be courteous. Thank you. But thankfully, we are developing greater capacity in our hospital systems. And again, as I said, the risk to children is minimal for the most part, unless they're immunosuppressed or have some other underlying conditions. Even so, the clinician, um, Dr. Bryant from Norton Children's, said that she would advise us to continue forward with masking uh, for the foreseeable future until such time that we felt like we were in a safer state. I feel like we're progressing to that state. I still think that there's risk in the community and I feel like mass to mass transmission is low and that's the reason that I would advise that 
you continue <laughs> forward with that policy until a point in time where we can say, okay, the risk is manageable at this point in time. Thank you, Mr. Rhodes. Uh, Ms. Hundley. Okay. Uh, I'm a numbers person and a goalpost person and tired of masks. Um, and tired of masking my kids because that's the only time they wear a mask is when I drop them off at school. And I'm just, when I look at the numbers that were reported today in our schools, because that's what we are governing is our schools, not our county. So in the last three weeks leading up to fall break, we were in single digit cases per day, and that's in a school system that has 12,233 kids. So in 10-11 to 10-14, 6.25 cases per day in a school system that has 12,200 and some kids. So how much safer do we need to be? <laughs> It, it does seem like there's minimal risk. The challenge is you're congregating those individuals and then they're going to go back out to parents, relatives, other individuals. If that's a risk that you feel is okay to manage, you have the authority to make the decision. I'm just giving you my guidance and advice. Right, and as the public health director, I'm asking you as a school board member, 6.25 cases per day. So what's your number? What, what, what's your number in our school system? Thank you. That in your mind is is acceptable to unmask our kids is it zero it's a fair question but i cannot answer from a specifically a school but from a community perspective i feel like when we get to that yellow zone which is a 10 per hundred thousand in your community that that would be a safer space all right thank you miss hadley um mr dodson i got one other question we've got a little, you mentioned kids with immune deficiency and what have you, will there be a level where when we create an optional mass program, do we create it for all the healthy kids or all the kids? Because a lot of kids cannot come to school that's got this problem if kids aren't masked. So where do you go from there? That is the major challenge. I mean, you know, that's the million dollar question. What about how the institution solves that? Because, of, like, little Cassie and I, for instance. Right, we're protected at the level of And And all the, to me, it's about all the kids, not just part of them. Now, if there's a number that eventually we come up with that would meet all the kids, I'm all for it. But uh, I think we need to look at a broader picture than just what's good for this, what's good for everybody. Yeah, I, I agree. The challenge, though, is I, I don't think you'll ever get to a zero-sum risk. And it may not be zero. Right. It may not be zero. But there should be a number somewhere where we make it safer for those, those kids. That's what I'm looking for. There's no perfect answer. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Rhodes, we appreciate you joining us this evening. I think you can get, gather from, from questions from board members. We are s still really wrestling with this issue. But appreciate everybody's input. And um, we'll always continue to try to make the best decisions we can for our students and staff. But thank you so much for, for staying with us and for those continued conversations with our medical professionals. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I'll say one last thing. I heard the conversation earlier about learning loss. I know as a public health director, there's a true correlation between education and public health outcomes. And that is one of the very reasons that we wanted to implement the test to stay strategy because we knew the harms associated with quarantine. So. Even though I've been accused of a lot of things, I've tried to be very proactive in the face of some extreme adversity. So I, I hope that, you know, I've provided effective guidance and I know it's a challenging situation. So I wish you all the best of luck and do not envy you in your decision. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to move along then with action item A. I, please. Yes. 
just uh, would like to uh, bring the attention to the board for there's uh, action item A is consider approval. Consider approval of student request for waiver to graduate early. Uh, that is, uh, need to, I would like to recommend to the board that we amend that uh, to say uh, about semesters, our course about semester instead of hardships. And I'd like to invite Ms. Pittsburgh, if she's still here. Uh, Ms. Pittsburgh, could you come forward and just share with the board about the clarification of that before the board has consideration? Good evening. Good evening. Just to clarify, each semester waiver are those kids who meet all their high school graduations by December, and if they can do that, then they can be considered graduated early. Hardship can happen any time within their senior year. So, unfortunately, it was just a, a typo that said hardship. It should, those should be eight semester waivers. Oh, so she's still on the table, she or he, or early or graduation. graduation. There. Well, yeah. Four students. Yeah, so instead of it oh, saying so we hardship, said, it should be eight semester waiver. Yeah, okay, <laughs> excellent. I think we can still do it. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pitzenberger. So then you recommend, uh, let me ask if there are any questions, additional questions, board members. So your recommendation, sir? Yeah, recommendation to approve. Motion to approve, please. Made by Ms. Hundley, seconded by Mr. Dodson. All those in favor? 5 0. Thank you. Action item J, sir. Yes, uh, consider approval for FY22 final SPDM mm -hmm. section 6 allocations to schools. Uh, any questions, board members? We see this report every year. Motion to your recommendation, sir. Yes, recommend to approve. Motion to approve, please. Made by Ms. Nyker, seconded by Ms. Hundley. All those in favor, that's 5 0. Thank you. Action item K, sir. Yeah, consider approval for the one time fringe benefit for OC uh, full time and part time employees, as you heard from Ms. Anderson this evening. Yes. We have that um, superintendent report. I think that's really good news. It's just a small step in the right direction. I even said that earlier. <laughs> Any additional questions or comments? Motion, uh, recommendation, sir. Yeah, recommend to approve. Motion to approve, made by Ms. Nykirk. That's appropriate. Seconded by Ms. Hundley. All those in favor? And that's 5-0. Yay. So <laughs> Thank you all. Okay, action item L. Yeah, consider approval of bus purchases. We also had that report um, and have seen this information a few times. So any questions or comments? Your recommendation, sir. Yeah, I recommend to approve. Motion to approve, made by Ms. Hundley, seconded by Mr. Dodson. All those in favor? 5-0. Action item M, sir. Yes, uh, consider approval of the district's COVID plan, and we will share a couple of slides here on the screen. And we'll wait for them to pull those up. Thank you. One more. Yeah, we'll start right there. So as you heard uh, Mr. Dees earlier in his uh, COVID update, we talked about our community health team that's made up of partners that are pediatricians, epidemiologists, infectious disease doctors from Baptist LaGrange, Baptist Health LaGrange, UVL Norton's, uh, the health department, Mr. Rose is here earlier, and our district leadership team. We review that data on a daily basis and share that with our board. And uh, continue to dis have discussions and, and collaborate with other districts within our region. And as you heard me mention, uh, over fall break, I visited two other districts uh, in terms of who had a mask option in place and visited the classrooms, talked with the uh, educators uh, in both those districts. Next slide, please. So, data points I'd like to just share that we uh, consider and that we've talked about with our community health partners. The county incident rate, student and staff positive cases, quarantine numbers, and test to stay, which, as you've heard tonight, does get into the positivity rate that we're seeing as a result of testing um, with those that are opting in. Other county state level data is reported by the Kentucky Department of Public Health that simply hospitalization capacity, as reported by the, the Department of Public Health, vaccination status that you've heard, those are other things that we uh, discuss. As a result of that recommend, the community health team, we've met uh, 
a few times leading up to this uh, today due to travel and impact this may have on COVID-19. Recommendation is to keep the school district's current plan in place and monitor the data closely. That was a recommendation from uh, that team I wanted to share with the board. The recommendation I would make to the board is continue with our current plan for the next two weeks. During that time, the Board of Education can review the same data points as presented tonight regarding COVID-19 and consider any recommendations that are provided. Um, so that's, that, for the next two weeks, that would be my recommendation to the board. And once if there's, after any discussion about that particular recommendation, um, I'd also like to suggest, or I'll go ahead and share with the board, I'd like to suggest that we draft a, uh, we're in the, in the works of beginning those stages of drafting that plan of what that would look like when masks are removed. You heard someone speak tonight that, well, when something, when something is a, a, a mitigation strategy, such as masks are removed or become optional, what does that do to quarantine? What does that do to testing? What are all those kinds of things? So my other uh, suggestion I would make to the board and recommendation is that we would like to draft a plan, not a final plan, but then share that with our community, with our parents, so that way we can collect input, so that way we know where our community stands in terms of parents, uh, even our staff, our teachers and our staff, to give input that we could then share with the board to help us make an informed decision along with data points and along with recommendations from our health officials. So in terms of clarification, superintendent, what we talked about was some sort of a survey that will be shared with, the, with our whole school community um, asking for feedback on, on certain issues. And we have discussed the timeline of conducting that up to on or before Friday of this week and then we will take a look at the results of that and um, depending on the results of that we will still have a another week which would be the second week following fall break in order to really uh, make an informed decision regarding trying to move forward with a mask recommendation did I summarize that correctly? Yes, you did. That's correct. So that's our obligation. That's our commitment to this community. Now, what I can't say for sure is that we will all be in agreement to do that, to, to um, return to a mass recommendation in two weeks. But it has always been our commitment to get there as soon as possible. And while I know that while I know that there are um, large numbers of you all appearing, you know, month after month, and I applaud your commitment, I also know that we have received hundreds of emails on the other side of this issue. So just so you understand, it may seem like, like you are in the majority, but that's really only one piece of the puzzle, how people feel. Um, we are still obligated to continue um, looking at all of this data that Dr. Radford has identified for us. So um, I hope that you will respect that approach and um, support us in that regard. So uh, what's your recommendation, Superintendent? Yeah, so we'll recommend again that we continue for the next two weeks and we have a um, uh, in two weeks is November the 8th, it's our mid-month session that we would review that uh, based upon our uh, discussion with our community health partners. And as uh, Ms. Fletcher just uh, shared uh, with the board that we would uh, present a, a plan of what all that the mitigation strategies would look like when masks become optional and that way we would get input from our community members, our parents, uh, and teachers and staff uh, so that way we have data to be able to help make the best the best decision moving forward and um, we are trying to be as, as transparent as we can be. Mr. Dodson. Uh, so in two weeks at a work session we'll discuss all this, lay it out, and if we agree with something it will be brought up at the next regular board meeting at the end of uh, November. We should be able to make a decision. Luke That's what I'm saying, but it would be brought up at the old, uh, the regular board meeting. No, at the mid-month meeting. It would be brought up at the mid-month meeting. Yeah, I'm making that commitment. 
There is no, uh, Ms. Hundley and I had this discussion earlier today, there is no hard and fast number for any of these metrics that, that we are aiming at because it is such a convoluted subject. And so I appreciate the fact that everybody just wants some kind of a, just a, just what is our, I've heard Suzanne say goalpost. Um, that is one piece of the information that we have to consider. We also really value and respect our principals and our teachers. And um, I'm extremely sensitive to their opinions uh, on this issue in terms of staying safe as they continue to try to do in-person instruction, which we also know is the most important thing we can do in this district. So you heard the recommendation, I'm rambling. Is there a motion to approve? Oh, Ms. Hundley, thank yes. you. Thank you. The November 8th, we're gonna discuss it. All right, is there a second to the motion? Ms. Snyker, thank you. All those in favor? And that is four, is there an opposition and one opposed? All right, thank you all. Thank you, Superintendent. And what's next? Ah, we have some information items for your review, please. The preschool report and the monthly energy usage report. And at this time, we do need to go into executive session. If you'll give me just a second, you all, pursuant to KRS 61.810C to discuss. Three litigation matters pertaining to student injuries, one special ed matter, and an employment claims matter. The board needs to go into executive session pursuant to this KRS to discuss litigation preparation. The public disclosure of which would jeopardize the board's position. So, motion to go into executive session. Made by Ms. Hundley, seconded by Mr. Kehoe. All those in favor? And that's 5-0. Thank you all.